Um, most health insurance plans are, are private. We rely on uh, health insurance um, from, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield or Aetna or save money. You can go out of network, like I said, but you're going to be, uh, they don't have a, they don't have a contract. They, they didn't negotiate a price agreement. And so you're going to pay a higher price. And of course, how would you know what the prices are anyway? I mean, healthcare is one of the, it's, it's kind of weird because, you know, we, if, if healthcare isn't a social socialized uh, system, I don't know, it's not a capitalist system either because, you know, you don't know what the costs are, right? It's not like you can go to the doctor, doctor advertises, you know, we're having a heart attack special, come on in, we'll, we'll fix you up for 300 bucks only this month and only with your coupon. I mean, you don't see those types of ads, you know, we don't know what the prices are. You can have a broken leg and go to one hospital and they charge you know, $3,000 to fix it. You go to a totally different hospital, they charge $6,000 to fix it. I mean, how do you know? They don't advertise their prices. So we, we know you're paying a higher price anyway, but, but how can they even say that they're trying to save you money when we don't even know the prices we pay for a doctor visit? We know what our co-payment is, you know, but we don't know what the actual price to visit the doctor is. And it's the only system that we don't know the price. You know, I would like to walk into a store and start buying stuff. <laughs> I don't even know the prices of anything you started to buy. That's basically what we're doing in healthcare. You know, we're, we're, we have this whole system where we're we're using the this, this, this stuff in the system, but we don't have no idea what it's costing us, really. And then we get these huge bills that they're like, what the, you know, what happened here, right? This is the type of, this is why I don't like to get into too much detail on health insurance programs, because the whole system actually kind of needs to be turned upside down. Um, it's a very, I think it's a very poorly structured system. And that's why we continue to have problems with it year in and year out. Um, we don't have these types of problems in the auto or other, you know, uh, even disability. We don't have these types of problems because uh, the prices are, are included and the benefits are stated. Here, we, we just have these problems. You just don't know, you know, what you're getting or, or who's charging you what. Uh, for whatever it is. And I'm not sure, if, I mean, if that would, that wouldn't matter in an emergency. If you're having a stroke or a heart attack, I mean, the nearest hospital is the best choice. But if you actually have choices to actually have an elective surgery, you have a hernia, you have other types of things, you have wisdom teeth to get out, it might be nice to pick a hospital that charges a lower price and has good service. Just like you would pick, you know, uh, any other business to choose from, because those are businesses. They are really are businesses. But in this case, these businesses don't tell us the prices of what they're charging us. So it's, it's a real, I think it's a real problem. It's a real, real problem. All right, so I'm gonna move on. Um, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, again, you know, a lot of these started as, as nonprofit. Again, it, this is a for-profit. Many, many insurance companies, healthcare are for-profit organizations, okay? They want to make a profit. So they want to make sure that they're not, they're collecting as much as they can in premiums and they're paying the least amount from the claims that they get. So it's not uncommon to, you know, your doctor says you need surgery for X and the insurance company says, well, we don't cover that. Um, well, then why did, why did your doctor say you needed it? And, and what's the insurance for? So the, this is the back and forth because it's for, these are for profits. These are for profit institutions, the hospitals, the doctors, the insurance companies. It's, we do not have anything close to socialized medicine, regardless, even if Bernie had his way, uh, you know, uh, and, and we just don't have it. We don't have anything close to it. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of crazy to hear that on, on political ads, but it is because if you know the business, you'll know it's just like crazy talk, totally crazy talk. Um, health insurance, but the government has two health insurance plans. The biggest one is Medicare. Uh, Medicare is for everybody if you're over 65. The only thing you have to, or you're, if you're disabled younger than that, but if you're over 65, it's automatic. We have universal government provided health insurance to seniors for Medicare. And they are thrilled with Medicare. You will never ever hear a senior citizen, I, I would doubt it. You know, I haven't in, in all my, all the senior citizens I know, they love Medicare. 
They love Medicare. Um, and this is exactly what they've been talking about. It's a government provided health insurance. It's not health care. It's insurance. You get health care by going to a hospital or a doctor. That's health care. This is health insurance. How do you pay for that? And so this is a this is the biggest one. And it is universal health coverage, socialized insurance, in other words, not medicine, insurance. But you only have to be a 65. And every person, as long as you're 65 and older, you're getting you're getting Medicare. You're getting Medicare. So this is wonderful. Um, it has several parts. The the Basic hospital coverage is part A, and it covers all your hospital uh, stays. And then there's other types of things uh, that are covered, visits and other things that are part B. Um, and this is the one that often requires seniors to contribute a portion of their social security or other check to get better coverage for part B. It oh, looks like I have a question here. Uh, aren't there people unhappy with the 65 age requirement. Um, unhappy with, well, the, the, the only people that are unhappy with it is they, they think everybody needs insurance. And so uh, what they're unhappy with is the fact that, you know, people are complaining that they don't want the government to provide health insurance to anybody, but yet that's exactly what they do when you turn 65, you know? Um, and so it's, and, and the people that are 65 and older don't, they, they're not, they're not complaining. They're not the ones who are, you know, oh, we don't want any government control of this. They're very happy to have health insurance, you know. Um, uh, people wanted it to, they, they want it to be for everybody, okay? One of the, one of the biggest things is we, we are the only country in the world that's developed and has an advanced economy in which we rely overwhelmingly on our employers for this. If you go any other advanced country, up to Canada, across to Europe, over to Japan, it's the government that has their own Medicare-like system for everybody, for everybody. In most cases, it's not a pure government in health insurance plan. It's, it's, a, um, it's a basic health insurance plan that the government provides through collecting of taxes. And then you have the option of going to private insurance companies to get what's called gap insurance which is you know, all the gaps that are not covered by the health coverage, uh, health insurance by the government, you can buy insurance programs to cover those gaps. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that we, um, we have a distrust too. Our country was built on distrust of, of a powerful central government. Uh, that was the, the argument uh, in the revolution against England is we don't want a king and can tax us without representation. Um, you know, and so even as our federal government gets <clears throat> a little bigger or more powerful, there's a backlash against that because it, it, it's traditionally part of our culture not to have a very powerful central federal government um, and rely more on, on local or states. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, it's necessary. It's necessary. and We really kind of need to deal with it. Uh, it's interesting because this, this is, again, if you're 65 and older, you get Medicare. And it's funded by the Medicare tax, which is part of your FICA taxes, Social Security and Medicare. Guess who's paying this? Guess who's paying this tax? You are, when you go to work, right? When you go to work, they're taking out of your check the Social Security and Medicare tax. And think about it, uh, there are about 27 million Americans, uh, maybe a little bit more that do not have any health insurance. Many of those people are working, they're working. So think about how you would feel if you're working uh, and they're taking a tax out of your check that you see coming out of your check every week or every two weeks, that's going to provide someone else with health insurance when you need it. I mean, if that isn't a kick in the stomach, I don't know what is, but this is, this is you know, there's a lot of issues regarding, you know, fairness and justice around what makes sense. And to a lot of people, it doesn't make sense for people to see that they, they pay their Medicare tax out of their check when they're working, but yet these folks don't have health insurance. So it, it's sort of like one of those things, how, how do you address that? I mean, I don't have an answer for you. I'm just saying that's, that's an issue. How uh, the seniors address that uh, coverage um, is they can, they can opt for what's called a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, 
which basically is similar to Medicare, except the um, you have the private sector providing the insurance rather than the government. Okay, and often those plans are are quite good, um, but they're they're based basically on what Medicare promises uh, the seniors in this case. Um, and what was added back in 2000, early 2000s, was uh, Medicare Part D, which basically uh, means that prescription drug coverages, uh, because again, if you're older, you're more likely to be on medication. Remember, the average American, I think the last statistic I saw, uh, the average American takes about four or five medicines a day, prescribed an average. So we're, we're really kind of drugged up. Uh, you know, uh, either way. And so obviously prescription drugs are important. And so this benefit was added in 2001, 2002. It was early in the 2000s, I think. Um, I'm not sure of the exact date, but this basically is helping uh, cover the cost of drugs, which of course a lot of older people are on. There is another healthcare um, insurance provided, uh, um, this is health insurance, provided by the federal government called Medicaid, it's actually run by the states. So every single state has what's called a Medicaid program. And this is uh, for the state to provide healthcare insurance. Again, we're talking about insurance, okay? We're not talking about services provided by a hospital doctor, that's all private. We're just talking about insurance here. And so, you know, this is a state program for the poor. So usually, and again, there's a lot of people um, that are on, you know, this public assistance program because you have to have, you know, you have to be, you can even be a little above the poverty level and still qualify. So uh, it's because a lot of those folks are working in part-time jobs or minimum wage jobs for employers that don't give them any healthcare benefits. Um, and so they, they need that, they need that. If you're over 65 and you're poor, you can be on both. You can have Medicaid and Medicare um, because Medicaid covers a lot of those basic things that Medicare might not. And again, this is paid by taxes, okay? And this is one of the biggest responsibilities of the state, okay, is taking care of people through this. So um, that's important. There's another insurance program for if you're injured on the job, if you're injured on the job or the job made you sick, okay? The illness happened because of the job. Um, this is a work, workers' compensation. It's limited to job-related stuff. It's not like this big program, you know, where you can qualify. If you're at lunch and you hurt yourself, too bad, you know, in most cases. I mean, it's, it's horrible in that way. You actually have to be on the job and get hurt. <laughs> or so the injury has to occur on the job. That's really the thing. And it basically covers the healthcare costs. And if you need a rehabilitation, um, this is what this insurance will cover. If it results in a death um, because of the injury or the illness, usually there is a lump sum death payment. Um, and it's one of those things. If you're self-employed, you're, you're out of luck. It doesn't apply to you. Uh, it is basically... Uh, it's an employer-based tax. It's actually a um, payroll tax. It's part of a payroll tax uh, because it's based on the number of employees you have in their first, I think it's $6,000 of earnings roughly that the, uh, the employer is paying in. I think, I'm not 100% sure on the number, but definitely they're, they're, the uh, number of employees matters. Well, there's been a lot of attempts at healthcare reform because clearly, if you don't, I mean, like I told you, just knowing that you can go shopping at a mall and you see the prices on everything, so you know exactly what you're buying at what price. Our healthcare system, you have no idea what the prices are, and um, and for some some situations you don't care because an emergency situation, the closest hospital is is the is the key. Uh, but if you have an elective surgery, maybe it's good to shop around. Maybe you prefer to drive 20 miles extra to another hospital if they're gonna, if you know they're gonna charge you $3,000 for an operation rather than six, knowing that you might get a bill for some or a portion of that. But we have a system that doesn't do any of that stuff, 
Okay. Uh, and it costs a ton of money. Okay. Our U.S. economy, if you look at the broad economy as a whole, we spend more money on healthcare than almost any other area. Um, and so this is, this is a real problematic, it's a problematic area. We'd spend, it's just costing us more than any other country <laughs> on healthcare. And so some reform is needed. And you know how your healthcare system is doing by looking at the data, looking at the, you know, what's our infant mortality rate? How many babies uh, make it past, you know, through birth without complication and so forth, or how many people, how many babies die at, at birth? And sadly, our infant mortality rate is not as good as some other countries that are developed. Uh, with what we pay for healthcare, it should be number one. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be losing hardly any babies. I mean, obviously, there, you know, nature has things that happen, um, and, and sometimes an infant will be lost, uh, sadly. But, you know, we should be doing a lot better. We also should be, with all this health care, we should be living a long life. Um, actually, our, our life expectancy just declined. Um, it's, it's crazy. And we have, we we live in a society that we eat so much crap, sorry to say that, that, uh, we have cardiovascular problems, you know, starting at earlier and earlier ages. Okay. And, uh, we, we just have a huge problem in this regard. We, we have a, we have the most expensive healthcare system and we're not healthy. So maybe we should look at that. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's basically uh, part of it. And again, uh, if you're a healthcare provider, you only get paid for providing a service. That's how the system works. So it does, like I said, it's a perverse system because it does encourage unnecessary uh, services in order for the healthcare provider to get paid, the hospital or doctor's office, or they will do extra stuff to get the money because that's how they get paid. I wanted to mention something. Yeah, go ahead. Um, because I work, uh, used to work in the service industry on commission, um, companies do not provide insurance. <clears throat> so I've seen the gamut of it. And what they used to do is go approach a company as a group and they didn't pitch in, but they'd say, okay, we have, you know, 50 employees, give us a discount. And the last I got that, I guess was 15, 10 years ago, something. And it was 1200 a month and it was for insurance. And then it started just getting out of control. And I started uh, working for myself and I use New York State of Health. Is that considered Obamacare? Um, it's, it's, yes, it, it's part of it. Um, I'm gonna actually get to Obamacare right now, in fact. Um, it's, uh, it is the Medicaid program for the state. Uh, and the expansion that's talked about under the Affordable Care Act or what was known as Obamacare is basically, look, we have, a, we have 27, 28, 29 million people without insurance. Their employers don't provide insurance like in your example, Clark. Um, why don't we let them buy into the Medicaid program and, uh, you know, and so forth. Matter of fact, let, let's get everybody in the, in the Medicaid program who doesn't have insurance, so at least they have some insurance. Um, even if we have to start charging fees for people, which is what, how it all started. So yes, uh, it is. It is definitely part of that, and it's it's part of the problem that we've been looking at. Um, the Affordable Care Act. Let's get to Obamacare because that's the Affordable Care Act is uh, is what we look at. Patient Protection Affordable Care Act is commonly referred to as Obamacare, but it really is this legislation. Um, the goals of this act is to make sure that citizens have health insurance. Okay. And of course, um, to try to reduce as much as possible healthcare costs, okay? And in insurance, it's kind of weird how it works. In insurance, it's easier to control costs if everybody is in the program um, because it's so much easier to use statistics and probability when you know everybody is in. And thus you can be more accurate in understanding the needs and the costs and pricing it 
properly. And, uh, and so we don't have that. I guess we have about roughly 10, you know, say 10%, maybe eight to 10% of the Americans that don't have insurance. And so, but they still need the hospital. They still get sick, they still need a hospital. So when they go, they can't pay. Who's paying that? All the people that have insurance is paying that. Uh, so it's unfair to us that have insurance to pay for that. So, you know, in essence, it's important to know that one of the goals here was to provide, was to make sure everyone had health insurance. So everyone's part of the, the insurance system and everyone's paying something toward that. And so in that sense, that was really the best goal for the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Uh, it is, it has been subject to a lot of lawsuits and it might, it might go down um, under the, uh, you know, the, the pursuit of the Trump administration to kill it off basically um, is still proceeding and it's going to Supreme Court uh, in two weeks. So uh, that might, that might kill it totally. Um, we'll see, we'll see what happens. So what this, and, and, I, and this basically your book kind of goes over uh, what it is, but what it basically did is it, it, it said, look, for all your employers that have these health insurance plans and for all your insurance companies that offer these health insurance plans, there's a few changes. One of the changes is pre-existing conditions have to get covered, okay? And that means that, because before, if you had a pre-existing condition and you moved from one employer to another, you got a different insurance company uh, from your new employer than your old employer, because they use a different insurance company. Uh, your coverage started there and it says, oh, well, you already have this, it's a pre-existing condition. And we're not gonna, if you get sick from these, we're not gonna pay. <laughs> so um, they said, like, it doesn't matter. We all sort of have pre-existing conditions because our genes kind of show that all of us are born with some, you know, proclivity toward developing a certain illness. So in essence, we all have a pre-existing condition. So why don't we just wipe this idea out of the, of the law and say it's against the law to do that. And that's basically what this, this did. Uh, Obamacare did. It extended coverage uh, for children until age 26, which is a, a long time. But oftentimes when uh, kids are young, they are not necessarily working for employers that offer health care. And so this at least covers them uh, in, in until age 26. Hopefully you, you can be established by then. Um, insurance policies had dollar limits. So they would not spend more than $1 million on you in your lifetime. And so as soon as you reach that million dollar limit, oh, well, your insurance is, not, is no longer good. You have to pay the rest. So they basically said, nah, that's not a good idea. Let's get rid of that as well, because you know, healthcare costs are going high. So a million dollar operation isn't what it used to be. Uh, you know. <laughs> so yeah, basically said, that's not a good idea anymore. Uh, one thing that it definitely did is said, look, you have to cover certain things you're not covering now which includes preventive care. Preventive care is overwhelmingly, you know, this idea that if you go to the doctor regularly, get your vaccinations, get this, get that, you're more likely to stay healthy, you know, and thus you'll cost the system less. It'll be if you, you know, if you are healthy, you take care of yourself and that's your habit in your teens, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, then you're probably not gonna get sick in your 50s, 60s and 70s. You probably won't get sick until you're very, very old. If you get sick at all, and so let's let's cover that. Let's actually encourage it because that's health care, caring for health, right? It also um, involves all those medical screenings, and so again, you can know up front if you are susceptible to something, and you know get tested early, so you can nip it in the bud. It's much easier to nip it in the bud. You can get. It's very likely that if you know you have cancer and it just started there you have a very good likelihood of surviving that. If you don't know you have cancer until it's stage four, you're a dead man, okay? And so the medical screenings are supposed to be, look, it's better to screen early, catch these things early because one, we can operate, it's less costly to save you. And number two, you live a longer life. And so that's part of the medical screenings. Um, and they actually, you know, insurance companies, it's a, this is a for-profit industry. They wanna make a profit. 
Uh, so everything that they everything they collect, they don't want to really spend. And the law said, look, you have to spend at least 80 percent of your premiums on the claims that the customer paid for. You can't be pocketing this and, you know, putting it to profit or all this other stuff. You got to you got to do the right thing because it's healthcare. This is healthcare, So it's different. Um, they did have these insurance exchanges, which basically allowed the states to offer um, Medicaid, Medicaid related products uh, that they develop, um, New York Health, you know, things like this, to, to everybody who didn't have it. Okay. And it's paid for by, you know, by uh, a fee based on the level of benefits that the plan offers. More benefits, the higher the fee. Which makes sense. If you have more car insurance, you're going to pay a higher premium. So nothing there. Um, okay. So again, there are since since Trump took office in essence, uh, when when Trump goes after Obamacare, just to understand what is true on the news and what's not true on the news, <laughs> um, is that if Obamacare falls, yes, the pre-existing condition law falls with it because there's nothing to take its place right now. Congress has not passed a pre-existing condition uh, law that the president has signed. And the president, just because they, just because he puts together an executive order doesn't mean that's the law. It has to go through Congress. So Congress has to act and the president has to sign it so pre-existing conditions can be protected. Um, so what you, what you are hearing about this can be, mm, um, can be annoying sometimes um, when, when you hear it, it's like, no, that's not exactly true, okay? Uh, so basically, we, we might not have the Affordable Care Act if the Supreme Court strikes it down uh, in November. They're going to hear the case in November. They won't rule. We won't know the ruling until the spring of 2021. Uh, if they strike it down, then it ends at that time, and we have a lot more people that will not have health care coverage. Uh, if it's saved by some miracle, it seems, um, then nothing changes. It'll stay in place. Okay. Uh, let me just go ahead and bring you to um, a, a website just to show you what that coverage is. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm coming back here. I'm going to take you to the web. And... Couple of things. So, in terms of the amount of Americans that have health, and this is the Census Bureau, by the way. Um, so, in 2019, the report, of course, they're doing the census uh, now this past summer, so the report's not ready for 2020. This is the latest report they have. Um, in 2019, 8% of all people, or 26 million Americans, did not have any health insurance at any point in time. Um, so do you think these 26 million Americans are never going to get sick or need doctor care? What if they have COVID, you know? So, you know, these are, these are the questions that have to be answered because if they have COVID, they go to the hospital, uh, taxpayers and policyholders are going to be paying for that. So wouldn't it be better to force them to have insurance than for us to pay all that extra money to cover the costs? That's, that's the question that they're, they've been debating. Uh, right now under Obamacare, that that is a possibility. But the state, again, we don't know where these 26 million people are. Not all the states uh, have expanded Obamacare coverage. So you have people in certain states, mostly in the South and certain uh, red states in the Midwest, like Kentucky, they just haven't expanded their Medicare program. And so you have less and less people that have insurance there. Private insurance is how we do things in America. 68% of people are covered with private health care insurance. 34% of people are covered um, with public coverage, which is Medicare or Medicaid. And we get our insurance through our employers. Okay. So that we rely on employers uh, for that as well. And so, you know, this is, this is important to know the, the people, the percentage of people that did not have any health insurance uh, actually increased in 19 states during the last year, okay? 2018 to 2019. Um, 
So if you have more states that have less people covered, it's a problem. These are actually what the 10 essential benefits that were part of the Obamacare law. Insurance companies have to cover all 10 of these areas. Now, prior to uh, the Affordable Care Act, your employer negotiated with the insurance companies for benefits. They didn't have to include all of these. Uh, they could only, they can include some of them, uh, but not all of them. And everything that they could do to provide a benefit to you um, is what they were trying to do for their employees. When the Affordable Care Act was passed and they said, basically the law said, look, all insurance programs have to have these 10 areas covered. Well, then, then they have to say, well, we have to go back and renegotiate this with our health insurance company because now we need all 10 of these covered. We only have seven of them covered. We need to add three. And again, as soon as you start adding coverage to an insurance policy, whether it's your car, your home, whatever, as soon as you start adding coverage, the price goes up. And so, yes, a lot of, um, a lot of people did pay more for health insurance, but they got more coverage. It's almost like saying you paid more for car insurance, but now everything in your car is covered. Yes, that's part of the plan. That was part of it. So uh, this is what happened with Obamacare um, in general is that that coverage was expanded to 10 areas uh, and most insurance, most employers simply had coverage for, like I guess it's six, seven or eight areas. So they had to upgrade, they had to upgrade their plans. All right, back to the slideshow and moving on. All right, so uh, we looked at this already. I'm, I'm gonna go on to uh, two things. Number one, uh, dental insurance is often separate from traditional medical insurance. Unless, of course, the only way dental services are covered in under your regular policy is if you got into a bad accident um, and they needed to, you know, take out some teeth or, or or treat your mouth as part of that accident, it would be covered. Otherwise, for general dental care, you have to have dental insurance. And I can tell you, if you haven't been to the dentist lately, they are super expensive. And a lot of people don't have dental insurance. Um, it's super expensive to get dental care. And of course, dental care is super important to your health. Okay, um, Just to know that your mouth is connected to your heart. Clean mouth. Uh, if your mouth gets infected, it goes to your heart. It goes to your heart. So make sure you understand all of that. There are other types of health plans that we will kind of get into the uh, specific uh, areas here, uh, but you can add various things to, to insurance. You can add riders, um, and those are some that are mentioned here. Okay. I need to move on to, uh, I'm just going to mention quickly, long-term care. You know, so any type of uh, hospitalization, um, nursing home care, um, things like that. That's the basic area that this is supposed to cover. Uh, in order to actually get a nurse into a nursing home, um, nursing homes average about a hundred thousand dollars a year to live in. Uh, and most insurances of course won't even touch much of that. You can get nursing home related care under Medicaid and you have to be extremely poor. Um, you're going to have to sell most of your assets. Um, things like that, if you do have assets and you need this. So this is part of the, the appeal for a long-term care insurance. Um, we don't know if it actually works uh, yet. It might work for some, there's some problems in, in every insurance area. We don't know exactly what all the problems are in long-term care insurance yet, because it's actually relatively new. Relatively new. Um, so let me move on here. And these are just some of the services that are covered uh, for, for that. No, I'm not gonna get into. Disability is critically important to understand. Uh, disability insurance is, is super important because in this case, we have a much greater chance of being disabled uh, than we have ending up in a nursing home. And so in essence, uh, disability becomes really important. What does disability insurance protect against? It protects against loss of income, loss of income. You're protecting your earnings. Uh, those are protected because you cannot work because of the disability, okay? So disability is really protecting your earnings from work 
because if you become disabled, you probably can't work or you'd have to reduce your hours of work. Uh, a friend of uh, way back in Boston, I lived in Boston for many years. Um, and, you know, I, my first job was in 1994 at, at teaching college and the librarian there had developed carpal tunnel syndrome. And carpal tunnel is a very terrible thing that happens in the wrists, uh, in this case for her. And as a librarian who could not really use a keypad, uh, a keyboard, um, I'm not sure what she could do. But she was limited to basically using her hands two hours a day. So forget about a 40 a week, 40 hour a week job. Um, down to two hours a day is 10 hours a week. What about all that lost income? Yeah, that's what disability insurance is supposed to cover. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you the definition of a disability from Social Security's perspective, uh, since that program is always one of the first ones that are brought up, but it's not necessarily, it's not the best program <laughs> that you want, um, because of, of the rules are actually quite specific. Uh, and one of the things that one of the better ins disability insurance programs is one that covers you for your own occupation. So in other words, if you cannot do your current occupation because of a disability, you are covered. And that's different than regular disability, which means you can't do any job. All right, so you can't be a teacher. Can you, uh, can you be a cashier? Okay, well, then you're not disabled. So, you know, it, it's one of those types of things. These policies cost more, um, but they are, uh, they are uh, available. Uh, disability does come from Social Security. It's not the only, that's only Social Security disability policy. Um, it's not exactly the disability insurance that I'm talking about here, um, although it's, it is a disability insurance program. This is actually specifically about you unable to be, unable to work at your job and losing your, your income because of a disability. There's short-term disability, policies and there's long-term disability policies and um, and your employer is the best place to get that. However, you can buy it individually. It's just going to cost a lot more money, a lot more money. And it doesn't cover 100% of your wages that are lost. It usually covers 50% of your wages up to, I think, 80% of your wages might be recovered through disability insurance. Uh, there's usually a waiting period before it kicks in. So you have to not be able to, you know, the waiting period might be 60 days, might be 90 days before you actually get benefits paid. So you're still going to need a, a savings fund. You're still going to need a, um, you know, that, that emergency fund. Uh, and when you buy disability insurance, there's always a period that you need to wait before it can actually kick in. That's a probationary period. So they're going to want to collect some money first before they actually start paying you, <laughs> right? Um, you also wanna make sure that it's renewable every single year and, uh, and it covers the cost of living, which is inflation. You know, so as your, as your wages would have increased with inflation, that's covered, that's covered. Okay, excuse me. Oh, and that's the end of our show. All right, so let's go back to our, uh, I do have uh, internet slide, uh, things to show you, so let's go there. So uh, Clark was asking about social security uh, disability. This is very specific. Uh, this is the social security um, website uh, that shows about, uh, about disability. Uh, first of all, they have a specific definition of disability, uh, which means that you cannot really do any job. You have, to, um, you have to have been paying into Social Security. So in order to qualify for the insurance, you have to have been paid in. Uh, fully paid in means 10 years of work. Um, so you know, that's, that's, uh, that's part of it. If you have fewer credits, you might qualify for a, a limited disability benefit, um, but it's possible. So disability. Um, Social Security disability is only for total disability. And most disabilities are more short term, they're partial. And short term might mean two, three years. Um, 
And for social security disability to be, to be covered by this, you have to have what's called a total disability, a total disability, which means you can't work at all, okay? So under social security, we consider you disabled if you cannot do the work you did before. Um, you cannot, they decide, they decide that you cannot adjust to other work because of the medical condition and that your disability has lasted for and is expected to last for more than a year or to result in, in your death. Um, so it's a very strict definition, okay? And they actually have ways in which they decide if you are disabled and if you qualify. And they actually outline this sort of step by step by step here. If you can, can wish, um, you know, is it severe? Because in order to be totally disabled, you cannot do basic things. It's hard standing, it's hard walking, it's hard sitting. Uh, you cannot do basic things. This is where this coverage comes in. Um, and so it's a very, very different type of uh, a coverage than getting disability insurance through your employer, which uh, will cover you for short-term, in some cases, long-term disability, should you have anything that interferes with your ability to work. Social Security is specific to total disability, whereas disability insurance doesn't have to be a total, you don't have to be a total car wreck. You can just have a bump, you know, you can have a fender bender and, and that's fine. You know, in other words, you, you might lose control or, or use of an arm or a leg or something. You don't have to be totally disabled uh, for most disability insurance. You do for Social Security disability. Social Security Disability, they won't even look at your claim really until you've been disabled for a year. So it's really not ideal. What are you going to do for that year? It's really not ideal to say, okay, I'm just going to rely on that because I, I've paid into Social Security. Yeah. No, the process is, uh, is a bit difficult. It's a bit difficult. And they would expect you, uh, again, they, you know that second thing. They said, we will determine you can't do another job. So that means even if you're a lawyer, doctor, whatever, if you can if you can sit in front of a keyboard and type away, or you can be a cashier somewhere and make a living, well, then you're not totally disabled, and thus you're not qualified for Social Security disability. So it's it's a tough road for that. Um, but if you are working right now, uh, and your employer does provide benefits, you want to ask about disability insurance benefits uh, that are available to you. Um, that's the cheapest way to get them. That's the cheapest way to get them. And again, as I mentioned, healthcare is just, uh, I think it's a mess. <laughs> Questions, comments? Did you learn something today? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna stop the recording and uh,